your blessings, God, and I ask that you would come here, that you would be here, and you just fill this place with your spirit. Open our hearts, Lord, to hear your word. Fill us with your word, your spirit, and guide us. Give us comfort. Give us peace in this time of uh, trouble, Lord, in our nation. And I uplift our country and, and the world, Lord, that they would, our ears would be open to hear your gospel and that many would come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Just bless us, use us to bring glory to your son's name. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Mike. Well, good morning, everyone. How are we doing today? Good. You know, we're August already. Year's almost over. Hey, if you came here this morning and you need a Bible, if you raise your hand, uh, we'll get you one and you can follow along. If you don't have a Bible at home or wherever, you can keep this Bible. If you like this one better, you can keep it as well. So, We are in uh, John chapter 10. And as we get to John chapter 10, we're going to see a little shift in the timing. Remember, we talked about a few weeks ago that um, we are about six months from Jesus going to the cross. So th about three years have went by. Um, and the last few chapters that we've been in, well, since we've been in chapter 8, uh, it's the same context, it's the same conversation. Jesus is trying to reach out to the religious leaders so that they could do their job. And today, as we get into chapter 10, he's going to do it again. And we're going to see some things that every, every week and every chapter that, that, that Jesus is before them, he has told them over and over again that he is the Messiah, that he is God. And we're going to see uh, in, uh, today that through from chapter 3 to chapter 10, 17 times Jesus has said that he's God. 17 times in seven chapters. And they don't want to believe him. They don't want to have an understanding. They don't, Jesus is not the guy they want. You know, it's, it's sad that Israel has rejected God from the beginning. From when God spoke to them in the clouds. They told Moses, ah, we don't want to hear it. Don't tell us anymore. Our heads are going to burst. Tell Moses, let him tell us. To the fact that they wanted a king. They wanted to be like somebody else. See, God wanted to protect them. He wanted to lead them. He wanted to guide them. But they didn't want that. They wanted to be just like everybody else. And it's sad because really, in reality, it's not just the Jewish people. We have a tendency to do the same thing. We want to be just like everybody else, but we're different, aren't we? God said that we were a peculiar people. We're peculiar. We're weird in a good way. Weirdos. You know, we're Jesus freaks. Wow, that's pretty cool, you know. Well, before you get saved, Jesus freaks, you know, that's a bad word. Yeah, those guys are weird. But, see, Jesus continues to try to reach out to them, reach out to them, reach out to them, and they keep rejecting, rejecting, reject, rejecting. Why? Because they wanted their tradition. They wanted to live in the law because they, they looked at themselves as being very pious. Well, I know more than you. You're just a common person. And, and Jesus is nobody, right? I mean, he, you know, he looked, you know, the, the Bible says that, that he looked just like everybody else. He wasn't special. Like when they picked their first king, you know, he was tall, dark, and handsome, taller than everybody else. Let's pick him. That sounds good. How well did that go? It didn't. It went bad. It went poorly. And so Jesus wasn't their guy. They wanted a Messiah to come in and get rid of Rome, and get rid of their oppression that they were under. Although they said they, they were never, you know, in oppression. They, were, they never had to bow down to everybody. And we all just kind of chuckled when we went through that part. Really? What's happening now? So as we come to chapter 10, if we remember last week, God, or Jesus, <laughs> same thing. Uh, Jesus healed a blind man. 
which only God can do. But they, they rejected it. And so we, as we come to chapter 10, same context, same thing that Jesus has been telling them all along. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Now, if you don't know what a sheepfold is, that's a sheepfold. Now that would be more of an uh, in the city type sheepfold. And what they would do is they would take your sheep and somebody else's sheep and maybe somebody else's sheep and they'd load them all in inside. And there would always be, and we're gonna see this word and I'm just gonna tell you now, there's always gonna be a doorkeeper, okay? And the doorkeeper was the guy that would watch over the sheep at night when the shepherd wasn't there. And so, uh, it says here, he, it says, most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. So there's a, one way to come in. And what is that one way? Through the door, right? But if you come up another way, if you come up another way, then you're a thief or a robber. Now, Jesus is specifically telling this to who? The religious leaders, the Pharisees. Oh, you got, you, you got in by robbery or thievery. You didn't go the right way. You didn't go through the door, through the door keeper. You came in some other way. You came in by corruption or connections. And a lot of times that's how these Sadducees, or Pharisees were appointed. They had a connection. They had an in. They didn't come in because they were called to do it. They came in over the wall or making a hole in the wall. Now, a lot of times, uh, this, this would have briars and stuff to keep the animals out so that they couldn't go over the wall. So uh, big stickers and, and they would try to get in and they'd get poked and it'd keep the, uh, the wolf away. So it says, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Now, this is a parable, okay? And in this parable, a parable tells you what? It gives you a story that you could relate to that would be more earthly, right? Uh, hey, we got some sheep, we got a door, we see the door, we see the sheep, we see the walls. But there's a spiritual significance in it. And so Jesus is saying, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. He's the one who takes care of the sheep. He's the one that cares for the sheep. And he says, to him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Now, you might have three sets of sheep come in by three different shepherds or four or five. And a lot of times when they were in the city and the grass was good and plenty, that's what you would have. So how do you go through and pick your sheep out? Oh, well, that one's mine. No, it isn't. Well, they never branded sheep. So how would they know? Well, it says the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Even to this day, a, a shepherd that has sheep can call them and you know what happens? They come running. Now you could have four or five sets of sheep in there and when the shepherd comes and makes a noise, they know that voice and they run right out to him. The rest of them stay in there. Isn't that interesting? And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Now that's an interesting statement if you look at it. He what? He leads them and they follow. That's what a shepherd does. He leads. He doesn't enforce his will upon them. He leads them and they follow him. 
Now what you're going to see here is that Jesus is the shepherd. And when he calls us, we what? We follow. We know his voice. How do we know his voice? Right here. Not dreams. Not thoughts. Not things that happen. But right here. This is how we know his voice. And if we know his voice when he calls, we what? We respond. <clears throat> there was a story from World War I. And uh, this, this, I don't remember where the, the army was from. And they, they were starving. And uh, so they found all these sheep and they kind of wrangled them in and, and they were going to bring them in and then kill them and eat them. And, and the shepherd wasn't around. He was off doing some other shepherding stuff, maybe some other sheep that were lost. But the story goes that uh, he found out that he had lost his sheep and right before the, these army guys were going to uh, kill these sheep and eat them, he started yelling and they took off and ran back to the shepherd. Kind of interesting, isn't it? And you know, and I know one thing, who's the sheep? We are. We, <laughs> that's good. We should have gave you the microphone so we could all heard it. <laughs> but a shepherd leads the sheep. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. So only follow the shepherd. And Jesus used this illustration or parable, but they did not understand the things which he had spoken to them. They didn't understand because they didn't want to understand. They didn't want to know what he was saying. They didn't care what he was saying. You know, it, it, it's just like today. The world today, the un, un, if you're an unbeliever, what do you want to know about Jesus? You don't care. Well, yeah, he was an okay guy, but, you know, that stuff, I don't know if it's true or not. And it's the same here. And Jesus is pointing them out and saying to them, look, you don't want to know because you don't want to do it God's way. You want to do it your own way. And so they don't understand the thing. You know, it's... People call, call Christianity, oh, it's, it's, it's one way. It's, you know, God is a God of love. There's so many different ways to get to God. Is that true? No, no. no, okay, so four of you knew that. That's good. <laughs> but there's only one way, isn't there? And that's through Jesus Christ. And that's the point he's making to them. You can't get to the Father unless you go through the Son. And so they didn't want to have anything to do with that. And so the interesting part about this is this shepherd in this parable is Jesus Christ. We are the sheep. The thieves and the robbers are who? The religious leaders. See, they want to get in in their own way. You know, to be perfectly honest with you, there's one way, one right way to get into serving the Lord. And that's through Christ. Because what? He called you. The Holy Spirit prompts your heart. You know, we ask every week about the children's ministry. If he's prompting your heart, then you should go do it. If he's not, then you shouldn't. And a lot of times, people get into uh, leadership in a church for a purpose. And that purpose is, and we're going to see, is money. It's prestige. It's, hey, look at me. I'm smarter than you. I'm better than you. But that's not it. 
Because a shepherd or somebody who is a pastor or an elder knows or should know that there's a difference between being called and being a word that we're going to see here, which is a hireling. Is it a job or is it a calling? Now, it's interesting because I can sit here and I can say that, but see here, you and me are the same. Because you know what? You have families. Are you the shepherd of the family? Do you teach people the right way? Do you talk about the right way or do you act like everybody else? Do you act like the world? When you meet with your family, are you a leader? Are you a shepherd? Or are you just there? Same thing at work. Are you leading by example? Are you the best employee because really your boss is who? Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Boy, you're making me feel real bad today, I'll tell you. <laughs> I, I obviously am not a good shepherd because you don't know those answers. But uh, thanks for yelling, I appreciate that. But see, we don't, we don't work for our bosses, we give them reverence because they're our bosses and God uses them to pay our bills, doesn't he? But in reality, you're the, you should be the leader of that wherever you work. Oh, well, I'm too tired, I can't. Oh, well, I this, I that. And always come up with an excuse. See, you can be a shepherd and don't be standing up here or be a leader in the church, but you could be a leader everywhere you go, can't you? And when people, when you have a family gathering, it's the same thing. Are you a shepherd leading in the right way or are you telling the dirty jokes as well and laughing at them and thinking it's funny? Are we teaching our kids that this is the way there's only one way to heaven, and it's through Jesus Christ. Is that what we're teaching them? What about your grandchildren? Are you helping the parents? Because you know how hard it is to raise kids, right? So are you helping them in a good way, or are you giving your opinion? Are we a true shepherd, or are we just there? And so as we, as we look at this, and, and, and Jesus is, is telling them, look, uh, this is a parable, and, and they didn't understand it because they didn't want to know it. And then Jesus said to them again, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. He's saying, I am the only way. I am the door into heaven. Now, there's two different ways that there would be a sheepfold. So you have this one that would be more like in the city, or I'm sorry, this one that would be more like outside of the city. So if it was a dry summer, they would go somewhere where there was good grass and they would build uh, an embankment or maybe there was left, one left there and, and the doorkeeper was not there so the shepherd would sit at the door and he would actually sleep at the door so one, the sheep didn't get out and two, somebody, animals or whatever the case, people trying to steal them, couldn't get in because he was laying in front of the door. So this is more of the normal sheepfold out in uh, the wilderness versus a, uh, one that would be like in the city or in the town that would have multiple um, groups of sheep come in. And he says, Jesus said to them again, most surely I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. And all who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep do not hear them. All that came before him to take advantage of the sheep were thieves and robbers. And he is specifically talking to the religious leaders. See, they're not there to serve, but to get something out of it. That's the wrong way to look at it. And I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be what? Saved. And will go in and out and find pasture. Now, the freedom to go in and out. Why? Because Jesus, the shepherd, 
is the leader. And they follow him. And they know his voice. And they hear what he says. And they are obedient to him. <clears throat> the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Now, interesting, a lot of secular or satanic musicians, and I could name a few who died early that were awesome. Jimi Hendrix, you know, didn't he uh, vomit and die, drowned in his own vomit? Uh, the lady too, uh, I don't know, my brother liked her. Janis Joplin, thank you. And, and, and on and on, the list, is, the list is, is long. The enemy comes in and gives them something and they're, and they're, and they're twisted. They're not doing it for the glory of God. And the enemy, as we know, comes to seek to destroy us. But see, the difference is, is that how, how, how do you follow that? How do you, how do you follow that? But see, Jesus is saying, but I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. See, Jesus is going to give us life, not only life that we live now, and yes, it's stressful, but he's giving us life. He gives us his joy. He gives us his mercy. He gives us his, our, his grace. He gives us his forgiveness. And we have life, and Christ wants us to have it abundantly. It's life with uh, whipped cream on it. Or how about a maple donut with bacon on top? <laughs> now, come on. All right, we'll put some chocolate on it, too. It's going to be awesome when we can eat that in heaven, right? And not gain 15 pounds just by looking at it. Or have your blood sugar go through the roof and you've got to rush to the hospital. But see, Jesus came to give us life and life abundantly in Christ Jesus. Isn't that better than the other way? Death? Stealing? Killing? And he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Now, if you would, turn with me to Second, to Philippians chapter 2, verse, I believe it's verse 3. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Verse 3 says this, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Now, he wasn't writing to the religious leaders when Paul wrote this. He was writing this to you, to me. Did you hear what it said? Let nothing be done through something that's selfish, something that I want. Ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. We don't do that very often, do we? It's hard to do, isn't it? Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ. What mind? Well, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now, I'm a little slow sometimes, but usually if I read it about 15 times, I kind of get the gist of it, hopefully. Is he telling me 
then I am to be like Christ. Is that a yes? yes? Good. Well, I got five people approving that one. That's good. It's better than the four. So is he telling me to put my own interests aside to help others? Yes. Yeah. Is he telling you that? Yes. And is he telling us if we're to be like God, who to be like Jesus, who made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant, a servant of all. The lowest servant you could get was who? A bond servant. So he says, look, being found, he looked like a man, right? He humbled himself and became obedient to the Father to the point of death, even the cross. You know, Jesus went to the cross to be obedient. Is that what that just said? It is. See, the love of the Father was so great and the love of the Son for the Father was so great. Remember when he went to the garden, he said, Lord, if there's any other way, Father, if there's any other way. But there wasn't, so he went to the cross being obedient. He put himself on that cross as an example for us. Not that we have to run to a cross and stake ourselves, although he does tell us what? Pick up your cross. Hey, you know, we're not to do it out of selfish ambition or, or conceit. So if we turn back to, he says, look, if anyone enters by me, they'll be saved. But don't be fooled by the ones that want to come in and steal. I am the good shepherd, no one else. There's only one way. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. See, there's a difference, isn't there? A sheep's going to stick their neck out. A sheep's, uh, I'm sorry, a shepherd's going to stick their neck out. A shepherd is going to do for the sheep. He's going to lead the sheep. He's going to be an example for the sheep. But a hireling, somebody who wants a job, oh, I can make a lot of money in the ministry. Well, you won't make anything here because you ain't getting anything. We don't pay anybody. You do it because you want to do it. You do it because God's called you to do it. And that's enough. And so he says, but a hireling, yeah, yeah, little problems come up, pff, they're gone. I know a pastor who's pastoring right now who uh, had a church and, and left the church because he wasn't making enough money. Went to another church where he can, I guess, make enough money. That's, all right, is that called or is that a hireling? A hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. Now, Jesus told Peter in 1 Peter 5, told uh, Peter to feed my sheep. Now, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. I believe it's in verse 2. It says this, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples of the flock. To the flock, I'm sorry, to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not feed away. That's not the reason you're doing it, but you're doing it because God has called you to do it. 
If you're in ministry and God has not called you to do it, you're in the wrong place. If you think that you're going to get something out of it, maybe this crown of glory, you're in the wrong place. And see, this is applicable to all of us because in one way or another, we are under shepherds of Jesus Christ, of the good shepherd. We live our, have to live our lives as examples to the other sheep, examples to the sheep of a different shepherd. So it's not just he's speaking one way of the shepherd, but remember who he's telling this to. Not only to us, but he's telling this to them. Saying, look, you, you know, I gave you this opportunity. I put you in this place. And now what do you do? It's all about you. It's not about the people. <clears throat> says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my sheep. He knows us, and we know him. And as the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. He gives life, not death. He gives his life on the cross because of the sheep. And the other sheep I have which are not in this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Now, who in here is Jewish? Anybody? One? That's it? Okay. Now we're going to talk about who? <laughs> Sorry, Daniel. Now we're going to talk about who? And other sheep I have which are not in this fold. Who is that? Everybody but Daniel. The Gentiles. Daniel, you can go if you want. Or, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Don't. No. Other sheep, not of this fold. Now he's telling this to who? The, the, the religious leaders. They had to be pulling their hair out, what was left of it, after all these things he's been saying to them for two chapters, for three and a half years, for three years. <clears throat> Therefore, because of, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my father. So what is he saying? He's saying, look, my father loves me and I'm gonna lay down my life for these sheep. Not only for the Jewish sheep, but for the Gentile sheep. Now it's interesting because as soon as I read this, I thought of uh, <laughs> a few guys. Uh, Copeland, Price, Hagen, they all say that Jesus was a victim. Did I just read that right? Wow, he did it. Why? No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. Hmm. Okay. Well, <clears throat> doesn't sound like he was much of a victim. Oh, and by the way, sorry, Watchtower people. <clears throat> he just said he takes his, takes his own life up. I give it, and I take it away. Wow. You know, you think, hey, let's just read verse 18. That kind of clears everything up, right? Jesus wasn't a victim. And Jesus had the power. Why? Why? To take your, he had the power to take his own life and to give him life. So much for Jesus not being God. Therefore, there was a division again among the Jews because of these saying. Division was the sheep and the not sheep. 
And many of them said, he has a demon and is mad. Why do they listen to him? Well, it's interesting because they would take the death, the unloyalty, the unfaithfulness, the murder, the stealing over someone who's willing to give his life for them. They would rather have that than have life. And in reality, we choose, right? God chose us because we chose him. God chose us as his children and we have the right to reject him or the right to follow him, don't we? Now you look around the room and you go, wow, God chose them? I do that every Sunday. I look at, no, I'm just kidding. I, I, I actually do that every Sunday, but it's towards me. Why did God choose me? Well, he chose everyone. But, but, I love him. And I know that he's my savior. I could reject him if I want. But I hear our shepherd's voice and I respond. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people who don't choose Jesus. You know, I choose to go to heaven. They choose to go to hell. I'm sorry. That's the reality, isn't it? You choose the Lord or you don't choose the Lord. And God is gentleman enough to let us make our own choice. And many of them said he has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Well, you have the miracles which come following the word of God. So he gave them the word of God. What words did he say that would give you that he has a demon. And look at the things that he's done. And now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. The word winter here is uh, stormy weather. But it's the feast of dedication, which is about December 25th. So we got about three and a half months left before Jesus goes to the cross. And it's eight days long. Uh, nowadays they call it Anybody know? Hanukkah. What? It? Hanukkah. Hanukkah. Okay. It's the Feast of Dedication. Uh, okay. So they, in about 165 BC, uh, the Syrians came in and conquered Israel and uh, started to tear down the temple um, that Nehemiah had built. Um, and they started tearing it down and they went into the temple and they slaughtered a pig in the temple. And a family known as the Maccabees rebelled, gathered up a bunch of people together and fought with the Syrians and actually ran them off back to their own country. So when they came back, they had, the Maccabees family purified the temple and that's why it was called the Feast of Dedication. Okay? And the Jew, and I'm sorry, and, the, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Remember, that's where he overturned the money changers. It was right when you came up through the, from the south, southern steps. It, had, it has the overhang over it, and that's where they would uh, check your stuff. But uh, Jesus walks into the temple and in Solomon's porch. So it's really the first place you would get to. And the Jews surrounded him and said to him, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you are Christ, tell us plainly. Now, most of the time when Jesus was on the temple, what was he doing? Teaching. Well, he, hadn't, he, hadn't, he didn't have time to do it. He walks in, pff, they surround him. They were waiting for him. And they surround him and say, hey, tell us plainly. Quit fooling around. Quit pulling punches. Uh, who are you? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Hello? 
Hello, 17 times in seven verses, he told them. And Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. He told them through the word of God. And if that wasn't enough, he did the word of God through the miracles that he did. He did what the Old Testament told them that he was going to do. Hey, this is how you identify this guy. He, in Psalms, it says that he looks like everybody else. So you won't know who the guy is. Okay. And all throughout the scripture, everything pointed to who? The Lamb of God. He told Abraham that I will provide myself as a sacrifice. Okay, who's this person going to be? Well, this person, this Messiah, uh, that's going to go and die for a nation, even later on as we get near the end of uh, uh, John and, and, and get to the crucifixion, we're going to see that even the high priest unknowingly admits that one man would have to die for the sake of the nation. And that would be Jesus Christ. So the evidence is there, it's just they chose not to believe it. Well, you know, I told you and you don't want to believe. You don't want it to be that way. And he says, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep, as I said to you. He says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Safe in the hand of the Lord. Never snatch out of the Lord's hand. The creator of the universe has you, if you are a believer, in his hand and it's never to be opened because you're his. And he gives you, he gives you eternal life forever. Eternal is a long time. Eternal is forever. Now we can't understand that, but it's still forever. And he says, my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. Is that plain enough? Who is Jesus Christ? No one knows. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I and my father are one. So he answered the question, didn't he? He told them pretty plainly, and then he said, you know what? Oh, by the way, I and my Father are one. I am God. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. You know what? It's funny because uh, people will say that he never said that he was God. I mean, hello, come on, please. But see, here, they picked up stones. Why? Because they want to stone him. Why? Jesus answered, many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? Why do you stone me? What did I do? I healed a blind man on a traditional day for you? Oh, what about all those lepers? I healed them. Leprosy, death sentence, nothing they could do. What about the people that were crippled? What about the guy that they lowered down through the roof? But he, that was kind of interesting, right? Because he forgave him first and then he healed him. Oh, there's no question. Who was he proclaiming himself to be? God. How, how, how do you, you know, hello? How many times do I have to tell you? But there was never any amount of time, was there? And the Jews answered him saying, for a good work we do, not, we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you being a man make yourself God. Now does it sound like he told them that he was God? Yes or no? Yes. So did he say he was God? Yes. But there's still people today who said, ah. He never said he was God. Okay, sorry. Sorry you don't get it. 
And Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law, I said, you are God's. Well, I'm going to quit there because I don't know how to explain. No, I'm just kidding. I felt like that when I read that. I was going, oh, no, this is that verse that I hate in John. Okay, come on. <clears throat> but he says to them, it is, not is it not written in your law, I said, you are God's. Now, that's interesting because who said it? What was written in their law? God's word. So did he just tell them again, hey, I said it, that you are gods. Now, to, so that we all understand this before we go to the next verse, what is he saying? Did you know, do you notice that it's a little g? Well, in most Bibles, it's a little g and not a big g, which would be representative of God. The little g is the word judge. Now, he makes that statement because they have power as a judge, as a religious leader to judge something, a murder, spots on your hand, whatever the case may be, clean, unclean. And they would have, over their ruling, they would have power over something. So this is why Jesus says that. But... It's a slap in the face to them because he says, if he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the son of God or the son of man. Either way, it's still God. So he makes a point and a difference between the two. Hey, you, aren't you gods? Aren't you judges? Don't to a degree have power over a ruling or whatever, over people? They brought the woman to him, remember? That kind of kick-started all of this when they brought the woman who was caught in adultery. Well, she was caught and they caught her in the act. Where's the guy? Okay. Well, you know, hey, if you're without sin, throw the first stone. Go ahead. Knock yourself out. But they didn't do anything. They left. See, Jesus is saying, look, you, you know, if he, the Father, called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified? He's talking about himself. And sent into the world, you are blaspheming, blaspheming because I said I am God? How do you blaspheme me? How? If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe in me. So if I'm not doing what the Father told me, hey, you see the things that I've done. I've given you the word of God. They were backed up by miracles that no one else could do. And if I didn't do this, then you could call me a blasphemer. But if I do, though, if, but if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. So that you understand, look, if I didn't do these things, I would be a blasphemer. But look at what's been done. How much more evidence do you need? I've given you the word of God, and then I've done these miracles. How much more evidence do you need? Therefore, they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. It's not his time. We've got three and a half months left. And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing at first, and there he stayed. So he leaves them. He goes on the other side of the Jordan River, and then many came to him and said, John performed no sign, but all the things that John spoke about this man were true. Evidence enough. And many believed in him, and many believed in him there, despite the opposition, despite the religious leaders. John just told, hey, this is what God t told me. 
Here's the scriptures to back it up. There's going to be this man. Hey, oh, behold, the Lamb of God who come to take away the sins of the world. Um, let's finish in Psalm 23. Psalm 23, verse 1, it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Who's the shepherd? It says, Jehovah is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Um, tender grass, new grass, not hard grass grass, but new grass, easy to eat and digest. He leads me beside still waters, uh, waters of rest. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path, paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The shepherd's care is protection love, mercy, sacrifice. To be an under-shepherd of Jesus Christ requires what? Love, gentleness, sacrifice. Doesn't it? That's what it requires. Is that what we're called to do? Go like this if you don't want to say yes. yes. Why say no when it feels so good to say yes? But that's what it is. Do we care enough for one another to help them? To pray for them? To spend maybe five minutes praying for them because they're struggling? To come up here on a Sunday morning and know that somebody has is sick and they're struggling not only physically but spiritually because that's even more important isn't it to pray for somebody's loved ones who don't know the Lord that's what a shepherd does isn't it a shepherd guards the doorway so that the enemy can't come in. And through prayer, we do that, don't we? That's, you know, that's our greatest weapon. It's also something that we do the least. And, and, and I speak for myself as well. And sometimes it's, it's uh, you, you get wrapped up in something else. You have to run out the door. Something happened. And it's always a distraction, isn't it? It's always there when we should be praying. We're flying down the freeway, having people, you know, cutting in and out of traffic because we're late and having people tell us we're number one. And you are a shepherd. You're an under-shepherd. No matter what family you're in, You know, and it's hard. It's not something that, that, you know, we just say and then all of a sudden it happens, is it? It's, it's difficult. It, we have to sacrifice. You know, if you're, if you're in a marriage and you're a man, you're called to what? Sacrifice. Love your wife like Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. Guys, how hard is that? It's really hard. It's unobtainable, isn't it? That doesn't mean we don't try to do it. But see here, Jesus is telling us this morning, he's a good shepherd, and we can rest in him. And by his example, 
we can take that into our family, into our neighborhoods, into our church, into the body of Christ. We could take that into our workplace. We could take that into our neighborhood. We could take that into our state. We could take that into our country. We can take that into the world, can't we? And nobody can stop you. But you got it, but you and me. It's the only ones that could stop us by not doing it. You know, we have prayer on every Sunday night that has, uh, that we do communion, and we're going to do communion now. Um, the worship team's going to come up, but we have prayer, and it's sad that very many people don't show up. It really is. I know it's kind of dinner time, but, you know, husbands, take your wife out to eat afterwards. Get a snack after you leave here. And then come here and pray for an hour and go out to eat dinner. Tell your wife, do your wife a favor. You don't have to cook tonight, honey. No dishes. Let's go, let's go pray for an hour and maybe I'll, we can pray that uh, we will go to some place that has a discount because it's expensive, isn't it? It's getting worse. But anyway, amen. So I'm going to pray. The worship team is going to come up. The men are going to uh, pass out the elements. At least I think they're all men. I don't know. I don't pick them. That's Corey's problem, not mine. So, so Father, we just thank you for your love and your mercy, for your gentleness with us, for your grace that you give us, for your love for us for your mercies that are new every morning, every time we fail, you're always there to pick us up. We thank you that you are our, our shepherd, the good shepherd, the true shepherd, that nobody could come in through that door except through you, and we thank you for that. So Father, I ask that you give us opportunities to be the under shepherd that you've called us to be. So Father, as we go through this next week, if you should tarry, if you should wait, Lord, so many things in going on, that are going on in our world. We have an election coming up. We have wars and rumors of wars. The nation of Israel getting attacked and then retaliating. The cost of living that's going up the jobs that are getting scarcer. Everything is going up. But Lord, you're always faithful and you always take care of us because you're our shepherd. And you'll make us to lie down in green pastures. And you'll put us by the water, the living water that we could drink and rest in you. So Father, may this be a week that you grab hold of us and maybe change our life a little bit more to follow you more and more. So Father, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your son, Jesus. And as we celebrate communion this morning, Lord, may we remember what you did for us. So Father, we ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all his children said,